and we don't realize how much a part of that, uh, how much a part of the Judeo-Christian tradition that has been. Yeah. But um, for various reasons, I think roughly in the last uh, 75 years or less, that has dropped away. And um, but my grandmother, who had a third grade education, as we like to say, knew her Bible so well that she could replicate large parts of it because she understood it and spent time in it. But now, you know, we've moved away from that. And I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be critical of anything, but I must say, uh, when we think about how we organize our services and we see how little in many of them we we actually present the Word of God, the Scriptures. Um, it's no wonder that people leave their Bibles at home and read a few lines off the screen, and that's all the Bible they get. Now, we know from statistics that most Christian homes have seven or eight Bibles, usually different versions. But uh, there used to be an old uh, preaching theme, dust on the Bible. And it's not the same to have recordings of it. Yeah. It's not the same to see it on a screen. Uh, you need to take it in uh, the bodily form of the book. And it needs to be dear to you. You need to know where to find things on the page. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like mm -hmm. when you have to get a new Bible, you're lost for two years because <laughs> the verses are at different places on the page. Yeah. And uh, But, you know, uh, like my grandmother, she could find anything. She didn't even know the, the, the uh, chapter and verse, but she knew where it was. Yeah. And that's where we need to be with the Bible. It needs to be like an appendage to our brain. And uh, we know where it is. Uh, whatever we're looking for, uh, because we're so familiar with the physical incarnation of the, of the scriptures. I think it was John Owen who said of John Bunyan, if you prick him, he bleeds Bibline. <laughs> he bleeds the Bible. <laughs> that well, Bunyan was so, yeah. though relatively uneducated, so yeah. saturated with yes. the Word of God. Uh, Might yeah. it be said of us, too? Uh, C.S. Lewis has this wonderful statement, the reason you don't need to be educated to be a Christian is because being a Christian is an education. <laughs> and that's really what he was thinking mm -hmm. about. And you know, Bunyan spent his time in jail very well. He did. And he became very a deeply. marvelous writer. Mm -hmm. And his command of the English language, that came from his studying the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, this question, you talked a lot about the heart yesterday mm -hmm. and you offered a, a definition of the heart in the lecture and you've written a book called The Renovation of the Heart. Mm -hmm. And again, because um, uh, in these interviews we want to um, address pastoral issues as well as other issues, I wonder how you might encourage us as pastors to preach in a way that touches the, as the old Puritans would say, the affections, mm -hmm. or really reaches mm -hmm. the heart. How might God use our preaching really to, to touch and to transform the heart into mm -hmm. increasing Christ-likeness? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the affections follow thoughts. Um, thoughts don't follow the affections in the same degree. But if you want to change people's feelings, you want to change their thoughts. And uh, now that's where the will, or the heart as I call it, becomes involved. Um, you bring people to a knowledge of Christ by bringing the gospel to them, the good news. That's thought. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that's knowledge, I would say, to which it is uh, 
by the power of the Word, which is living and powerful in itself, and the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. it solicits the will to surrender to God. You have to go there first. When you have a will that is under, unsurrendered to God, it is subject to all kinds of bad thinking and bad affections, bad emotions. Like I hope to talk a good bit about anger in the period to follow here. Uh, where does anger come from? Anger comes from a misunderstanding of who one is and their world and where God is and who other people are. So you have to have clear teaching uh, about God and about our soul and about how to live for Christ and who Christ was and what he's doing in the world now. Uh, and that teaching uh, can transform our affections from hate to love, from fear and anger to confidence and joy, and so on down the line. Uh, these are not actually just feelings. They're more like dispositions, like joy and love and so on, but fear and hate and so on. They, they are really dispositions of character that take over the person. But they have these terrible feelings with them. And if you, if you just try to deal with the feelings without changing the thoughts, you'll become slave to your feelings. And there's a real danger of that in religion because people are apt to go for the feelings and use that as a basis for decision without going through the mind. And that makes what we have in this country where is uh, many people come forward in meetings and you never see them again. Right. Uh, and uh, they don't become disciples uh, because they are... Paul's merciless phrase for this is, their God is their belly. Mm -hmm. And they're belly worshipers. And by that he means the feelings. They worship their feelings. And you don't you don't go for the feelings, you go for the clear apprehension of truth. And then that lays a basis for decision and provides the feelings that are appropriate for it that can over, overcome habits that keep you away from God. Uh, so we have to work with the content of the Word and bring it to bear as clearly as we can, as fully as we can, and you can't do that without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. But we're not waiting on the Holy Spirit. I mean, he's ready to do this. The task that we have is to speak clearly. And this goes back to the point about if we don't think of ourselves as conveying knowledge of God and reality, then we will think of ourselves as exhorting people, hoping that divine lightning is going to strike them mm -hmm. and something will happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is where we get the embarrassing position of, of pastors and teachers as motivators. Let me say something about that, because I think this is one of the greatest tragedies presently, is that we have our leaders are in the position of trying to motivate people to do things they don't want to do. And, that's, and the standard of success, almost, is how well you can get people to do this. Whereas we should be teaching in such a way that the motivation change changes because the understanding mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. If I clearly understand that the house on, is on fire, I don't need someone to motivate me to get out. You know, uh, If you're driving your car, you don't need someone to motivate you to turn the wheel and put on the brakes or speed up or whatever. That's knowledge. We've lost our confidence in knowledge. And then we turn to feeling. And of course, that's the source of all addiction. An addict is someone who has abandoned their will to their feelings. And they will yeah. tell you, I cannot resist. Everyone knows that you can resist. Uh, you have to find out how. You have to have a knowledge basis that will fortify your will so that you can resist. There is no addiction you can't resist unless it has moved into the area of demon possession or something of that sort. And then 
you have to have ministry in a different way for that. But the main thing we need to help do for people in all areas, because it, this, the problem in religion is matched by so many things in our society. Uh, for example, abuse in families. Um, where does our epidemic in diabetes come from? Uh, and uh, now this is really dangerous, but the addiction of so many people to sports. Mm -hmm. uh, where does that come from? It comes from a lack of knowledge about life. And if that knowledge is not provided, there's really no remedy. You cannot motivate people into salvation. You have to communicate truth, which is the word of the gospel. And then that, as Paul knew so well because he had watched it work in so many situations, it is the power of God unto salvation. Mm -hmm. You know? That's real power. Knowledge communicated in power is the secret to the problems, solving the problems of humanity. And we, as ministers and teachers, have the responsibility of bringing that to bear. And then we're in great opposition to a world system which denies that. So we really have to understand uh, the significance of, of this idea of knowledge and power. And uh, Paul's great statement in, uh, what is it, Second uh, Corinthians 10, uh, I think I've got my reference wrong here, but you'll recognize it where he says, for we war not against flesh and blood, but our weapons, the weapons of our warfare are powerful mm -hmm. to casting down strongholds. That's where we as ministers must stand today in our communities and realize the dignity of our calling and that we bring something no one else can bring. Mm -hmm. The most important thing that is happening in any community is meant to be what's going on in the church. And we have to reclaim that and move back towards oh, yeah. it. Go I'm afraid ahead. I preached a sermon to you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, you <laughs> preached a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Willard, I have uh, so many things I would love to ask you, and um, one of them is is, is that uh, I've been exposed to uh, Asian Christians in a variety yeah. of ways, right? Um, and I find so much uh, similarity uh, in the ways in which they talk about faith, so they talk about the spiritual walk, the spiritual mm -hmm. life. Um, and um, and I, I just I want to ask you if uh, if you're just both drawing from the same source. Obviously you are, but if we you've read the same book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you've also had any uh, exposure to uh, to the writings of Asian Christians or uh, practices. You know, not really. Years ago, I was attracted by the title of Watchman Nee, the Normal Christian Life. I. And that's exactly why I asked yeah. you. Yeah. But by the time I had read that, I had okay. spent so much time uh, reading uh, Luther and Calvin and Wesley, and and a big man for me was Charles Finney. Uh, that I didn't find anything new in that. I was yeah. just I love that title, yes. <laughs> the normal Christian life. Yeah. Uh, because the normal Christian life is, is what you see in Colossians yeah. 3, 1 through 17, yeah. or in the other great passages. That's the normal Christian life. And uh, we need that reaffirmed. Yeah. And that, that reaffirmation in him did help me. Mm -hmm. um, I have I've read other writings by uh, him and uh, some others. Uh, and I certainly applaud what they're saying. Circumstances have forced them to the reality. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't say that I would ask for it, but probably the best thing that could happen to the American and the Western church is persecution. Mm -hmm. If we really had to pay a price kind of interesting on university campuses. There's a lot more people on the faculties of standard universities are Christians than you would think. 
And I assure you that if the word went out that all the Christians...